Um, so our paper of the ultra long title discusses the security of data on Bluetooth low energy devices. I'm sorry? Oh, should I speak louder? Okay. Um, discusses the security of data on Bluetooth low energy devices when accessed by Android applications. So I'll begin by giving a brief overview on data access mechanisms with Bluetooth low energy. With Bluetooth low energy, unlike with classic Bluetooth, data is handled primarily as small discrete values, and these are referred to as attributes. There are different types of attributes, and the type that we are most interested in are called characteristic value attributes, and these hold the actual data values of interest. So for example, a characteristic value could hold a user's heart rate measurement or cycling speed. It could also hold the speed of a BLE-enabled hoverboard. Accessing a characteristic value is fairly straightforward. You send a request and you get a response. There are other access mechanisms, but I'll only be focusing on request responses. So while it could be a fairly straightforward process, there are occasions where we might not want it to be quite this straightforward because the characteristic value holds data that is either sensitive or critical. So if, as I mentioned, a characteristic value holds a user's heart rate or glucose measurement, then that data has associated privacy concerns, and we wouldn't want random people reading that information. If, on the other hand, the um, characteristic value controls the speed or the movement of a BLE-enabled hoverboard, then that data has safety implications, and we wouldn't want random entities being able to write to it. And so there are occasions where we would want to control access to the um, characteristics. If we are to do this natively, then we would assign permissions to the characteristics or to attributes in general. So there are three different types of permissions, and only the first two are actually fully defined within the Bluetooth specification. Access permissions essentially say whether or not an attribute can be read and or written. Authentication permissions restrict access to an attribute by requiring that the access request come over an authenticated encrypted link. And the way we get such an authenticated and encrypted link is via pairing. And we have termed um, characteristics which have associated authentication permissions as being pairing protected. Authorization permissions are implementation specific and are lef left up to developers. So if we take the most common use case, especially in the consumer scenario, of a BLE device that um, interfaces with a mobile application, we ask ourselves, um, where the device has an official application that it's supposed to interface with, would another unauthorized application residing on the same mobile device be able to access pairing protected data from the BLE device? And to test this, we prototyped a BLE device using the Nordic Development Kit, and our device has a protected characteristic on it. We also developed two Android applications, one which is a good app and which is supposed to be able to access the protected characteristic, and another which is the malicious app which is not supposed to be. Um, and I should say that the two applications have essentially the same functionality. The difference is mainly in terms of user expectation and awareness. So in the first unauthorized data access scenario, um, we launch our good application and it scans for and connects to our BLE device and issues a request for accessing the protected characteristic. Because the two devices don't have a trust relationship at this point, this will result in an insufficient authentication error. And as soon as the Android operating system sees this error, it will initiate the pairing process. And at this point, it may be the first time that the user becomes aware that this application is trying to access data from their BLE device. And I should mention here that I only consider strong pairing mechanisms where user interaction is actually required. So if the user decides to go ahead with pairing, then the two devices will uh, generate keys, encrypt the transport between them, and then typically go through a process called bonding where long-term keys are generated. If the good app tries to read or write the pairing protected characteristic from that point onwards, it will be met with valid responses because the request will be coming over the encrypted link. So now let's say our good app disconnects and our malicious application scans for and connects to the device. What we saw from Android um, BLE logs is that as soon as the connection takes place, the Android operating system automatically encrypts the link, presumably using the credentials that were generated during the previous pairing process. This means that the malicious application has this automatic um, 
encrypted link over which it can issue read-write requests for the pairing uh, protected characteristic and get valid responses. And the thing here is that the user won't be aware because link re-encryption usually takes place silently. Now this happens because pairing essentially happens between devices um, rather than between the application layers. And it, in fact, it happens between the lower layers of the BLE stack. So that means that the paired link is going to be common to all the applications of the requesting device. A similar result was identified for classic Bluetooth a few years ago by Navid et al. But with Bluetooth low energy, a malicious application is able to access data in ways that would not be possible with classic Bluetooth. So that brings us to our second unauthorized data access scenario, and we start afresh. We remove the existing pairing credentials from both devices, and we launch our good app again. It scans for and connects, triggers the pairing exchange, and results in an encrypted link, as before. This time, though, let's say that the good app doesn't disconnect. So while it's still communicating with the BLE device, a malicious application that's running at the same time can issue a get connected devices command. And this will return a list of the Bluetooth devices that are currently in a connection with the Android device. The malicious app can then select our test device from that list and connect or make use of the existing connection. So it can piggyback onto the connection and issue read write requests um, for the characteristic. So this is a form of opportunistic data access which is not possible with classic Bluetooth. In classic Bluetooth, um, as Navid et al. Um, found, an application creates a socket connection to a Bluetooth device, and while one application is in a connection, another cannot connect. But with BLE, multiple um, applications on the same device can share the same connection to a BLE device. Another interesting thing to note here is that the malicious application didn't need to perform scanning. So if we go back, the good app scanned for and connected to the BLE device, but because the malicious application uses an existing connection, it didn't need to perform scanning. And this has an interesting impact on the permissions that need to be requested by the two applications. So because our good app um, performs scanning and we consider scanning without a scan filter, it needs to request the Bluetooth and Bluetooth admin permissions. And from Android 6.0 onwards, it also needs to request location permissions. And because location permissions are considered to be dangerous permissions, the first time that the good app is launched, a confirmation dialog is going to be displayed to the user, asking them whether they're okay with the fact that this application is accessing their location. Because on the other hand, the malicious application doesn't uh, perform scanning, it only needs to request the Bluetooth permission. And because this is not a dangerous permission, there'll be no confirmation dialog. And from the user's point of view, the malicious application is going to seem more benign than even the good app. And this could influence the number of downloads that the malicious application can generate. So we've seen that it is possible for um, unauthorized applications to access data, um, or pairing protected data from BLE devices. So our question would then probably be, what would we do to protect the BLE data? And ideally what we want is a solution where protection extends from the BLE device all the way up to the application on the requesting device. The issue is that there are multiple stakeholders within the BLE ecosystem, and it's difficult to determine which stakeholder should be responsible for making the changes that would safeguard data. So just based on the data access scenarios I've shown, it might seem that Android needs to be the one to make the changes, uh, to, for example, not allow multiple applications to share a connection, and also maybe to do something like associate pairing credentials with the application that originally triggered the pairing. The thing is that, Pairing and the fact that it happens between, um, say, the lower layers of the BLE stack is something that's defined within the Bluetooth specification itself. And so maybe the specification needs to be modified or perhaps added to to incorporate additional protection mechanisms that extend all the way up to the application layer. In addition, the Bluetooth special interest group who define and maintain the specification also define things called profiles, which can be implemented by BLE devices. And there are profiles for different things. So for example, there's a heart rate profile and a glucose measurement profile. And within these profiles, pairing is specified as the only security mechanism. So it would seem from them that pairing is sufficient for handling um, of a protecting sensitive data. And we've seen that it's not. So in addition to modifying the specification, perhaps the special interest group should also modify these profiles as well. The thing is that BLE has this sort of promise of flexibility that a user should not be tied to one application, that they should be able to um, 
download and use multiple applications with their devices if they want to. And so any protection mechanism they create, there has to be some way for them to allow multiple applications that the user specifically authorizes to connect to their BLE device while disallowing everything else. The problem is that um, both of these, like if either one of these entities are to create um, any changes, then there will be some design and development effort involved and it's not going to happen in the uh, immediate term. And so right now, like it or not, it's probably up to the BLE developers to implement end-to-end -end security if we want our BLE data to be safeguarded. And that brought us on to our next question, which was what proportion of BLE devices out there right now actually have such end-to-end -end protection for their data? So we're saying data traverses between a BLE device and an application, and we want to know how much of the data is protected end-to-end. -end. And by protection, I do mean cryptographical protection. And to test this, we could either test the BLE firmware or we could test the mobile application. And Android APKs in particular are much easier to come by and easier to decompile and analyze than BLE firmware. And so we went the APK way. We developed a Python tool called BLE Crypt Tracer, which would analyze Android APKs and try and identify the presence of a link between BLE data and crypto functions. So the tool does this by using AndroGuard to decompile APKs and obtain their intermediate SMALI representation. It then identifies any beta, uh, BLE data access calls within the code. Um, and from that point, it'll try and trace through the code to see whether the BLE data hits a cryptographic function on the way, which would indicate that the data has been cryptographically processed. Our tool does this in three different stages. And in the first stage, it tries to identify the most direct link possible. Um, between BLE data and crypto functions. And it does this by considering only uh, direct register or field value transfers as well as the results of immediate method invocations. And if a link is identified in this manner, then the result is given a confidence level of high because we're fairly certain that cryptographically processed data will actually exist. If a direct link cannot be identified, then the tool will, in addition, consider abstract and interface methods, as well as registers that were used as arguments to previously encountered methods. And if a link is identified using this method, then because there's some level of uncertainty involved, the result will be given a confidence level of medium. If neither method um, actually produces a result, then the tool will look through every instruction of every method that was previously encountered, which originated from the BLE data access call. And if any of those instructions contain a reference to crypto, then the result will be given a confidence level of low because there's quite a lot of uncertainty involved. We tested our tool against the Droidbench benchmarking suite, um, which was modified for the BLE case. And we found that in general, the results from our tool at confidence level high were on par with other taint analysis tools, but BLE Crypt Tracer was better suited for that specific use case of identifying end-to-end -end protection for BLE data. We also executed our tool against almost 19,000 real-world APKs that have BLE data access calls, and these are the results at a high level. Now, because of the um, uncertainty I mentioned with results at medium and low, I'm only going to focus on those results that either um, where an APK was identified as having crypto with high confidence or where no crypto was identified at all. And we can see that almost half of all APKs um, actually don't seem to have end-to-end -end protection for their BLE data. We analyzed our results further and we found that more than half of the APKs we tested actually made use of third-party libraries to incorporate BLE functionality. So these could be wrapper functions or they could be something like beacon libraries. And interestingly, um, those applications that use third-party libraries were more likely to have end-to-end -end protection for BLE data than applications where the BLE functionality was incorporated by the developer themselves. Um, in fact, one particular beacon library um, actually accounted for over 85% of all the cases where we identified crypto with high confidence. We then um, analyzed our results in terms of the Google Play categories that the APKs fell under. And we saw that interestingly, APKs that were under medical were some of the least likely to have end-to-end -end protection for their BLE data. 
And this seems strange because you would assume that they'd be the most likely to have uh, protection. But then we analyzed a subset of these APKs and we found that some of them at least um, made use of the official BLE profiles in which pairing is uh, specified as the only protection mechanism. So that could account for at least part of these results. Further, we looked at those APKs where um, BLE, uh, cryptographically processed BLE data was identified with high confidence level and we ran these APKs through a tool called CogniCrypt. Um, and CogniCrypt essentially checks for cryptographical correctness within Android APKs. And we found that in some cases, bad crypto practices were being used, such as the use of unsafe crypto modes or hard-coded keys. And this would imply that even when BLE data is supposedly protected by uh, cryptography, sometimes the crypto might not be implemented correctly and the BLE data might still be vulnerable. So in summary, um, we've seen that pairing protected data may be vulnerable to unauthorized ac uh, access by uh, different applications. And this is regardless of the strength of the pairing mechanism. So in our test, we used LE secure connections with numeric comparison, which is one of the strongest. We've also seen that because of the different stakeholders involved in the BLE ecosystem, it's difficult to determine which stakeholder should make any changes to protect BLE data. Right now though, security is probably in the hands of BLE developers, but it's possible that the developers themselves are not aware of this because almost half of all the APKs we tested showed no evidence of end-to-end -end protection for BLE data. Our tool is available on GitHub um, and we would welcome any feedback or suggestions. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. So if you have a question for our speaker, feel free to come to one of the microphones uh, in the aisles. Did I put everybody to sleep? Very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, one thing I've uh, also seen in apps is that they do end-to-end -end encryption between the app uh, not, not between the device and the server, so the app would not do any encryption or decryption. How did you deal with that in your statistics? We didn't actually because we can't, as in we did know that it's possible data would just be shuttled through an APK so that the end-to-end the -end would be between a server and the BLE device, but there's really no way of checking or accounting for that because just because data is transmitted to a server doesn't necessarily mean it's being cryptographically protected. So we can't say yes or no. So we unfortunately had to sort of disregard them. Thank you. So I actually have a question. Uh, so um, it, it's clear that there are a lot of weaknesses in these applications, um, but I was curious if you were aware of any situation where um, some party might be exploiting some of this in the wild. No, we actually focused mainly on benign applications and the presence of crypto, so we weren't considering malicious entities at, uh, when we were doing the previous analysis. We're doing some right now which may produce some interesting results. We have, we have one more question for you. Yeah, sorry, that took a while for me to go. Um, th thank you for the talk, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, um, uh, you mentioned some of the malicious apps that could sort of piggyback onto the BOE connection. Um, I was wondering if there are like, uh, not necessarily malicious, but just regular apps that could possibly do this like accidentally, and if you've encountered them and sort of what they might look like. I mean, I have seen questions, I mean, on Stack Overflow and things where people do seem to want to identify connected devices for some legitimate purposes, but um, I, I, they don't actually mention the purpose and I can't think of any reason why you would want to use an existing connection, especially between two different apps. So I would say honestly just get rid of that functionality if I had the choice. Cool, thank you. All right, um, so um, let's thank our speaker one more time.